The past 72 hours uh, have been totally crazy, and I have a pretty insane update to this story. Now, if you're not familiar with what happened, um, you can go back and look at my last video. I was involved in like a freak plane incident over the Atlantic Ocean. If you haven't watched it yet, you should go check it out. After I posted this video, I heard from a guy who was on the same plane that I was on, but the previous flight. The exact same issue happened to him. They were flying from New York to Europe, and the plane got diverted midway over the Atlantic Ocean and had to fly back to New York. So I'm going to interview him along with Pilot Kelsey, aka the YouTuber 74 Gear, in just a bit. But first, I want to address some criticism that my original video received. And so initially, this story got covered by a lot of international press. I was very excited by this at first because I essentially wanted Delta to respond. I mean, this was a terrifying incident that uh, freaked me and a bunch of people on the plane out. To say nothing of stranding hundreds of people at the airport with, you know, having to get hotels and like rebook everything. But then something else started happening, which is that I started getting a lot of criticism from the aviation community. Essentially being like, you were being dramatic, this is actually a very safe situation, and you really had nothing to worry about. Now, before I get into the new news, I wanted to respond to this criticism briefly, um, because I think it's important. First of all, like, I get it. Point taken. To recap essentially what happened was we were flying over the Atlantic, the captain gets on, tells us there's a fuel issue, and we turn around and fly back to New York. Now, in the moment, I, and many other passengers as well, genuinely thought there was a chance that we were all going to die. I stand corrected on this point. At the time when this issue was detected, it seems like it was pretty safe. And that getting back to New York at the point that the issue was detected and we turned around, we were probably gonna get back to New York with no issue, right? Planes are designed to fly with fuel imbalances and it probably wasn't a huge issue at the point it was detected. And I don't want people also in general to be afraid of flying on planes, right? Because rationally, I know, and if you look at the statistics, you can very clearly see that commercial airline travel is almost the safest form of transportation that you can possibly take. Like, it's safer than driving in cars, it's safer than helicopters, apparently it's even safer than walking on a per mile basis. But the way that I reacted, and the way that many other passengers on the plane reacted as well, is I think a natural reaction, given how unusual and incredibly rare this situation is. You know, we had no idea. Many of us are already terrified of flying. Like, every time I get on the plane, <laughs> I'm already fearing for my life. And like, yes, rationally, I know that's silly. Rationally, I know that flying commercial is unbelievably safe, right? but I still freak out. It still doesn't help me rationally knowing that I still freak the hell out uh, when I get on the plane. And so when you compound it with an issue like this, I think you can see how a lot of people freak the hell out and think they're about to die when they're probably not. Today we have Fred. He was from the previous flight on the same plane as mine that had the same issue. Um, and we are also joined by 74 Gear, a.k.a. Pilot Kelsey. So grateful to have him here because, like, the two of us don't know shit about planes. And so it's nice to have, like, an actual pilot. So he's both, he's both a 747 pilot, but also a popular YouTuber. So you guys should definitely go check out his channel. He makes all kinds of cool videos about, about uh, flying. I wanted first to ask you, Fred, uh, you know, after, after the incident happened with my plane, you messaged me saying, like, hey, the same... The same thing happened with my flight. Um, and can you describe like how, like you were, you were just like going on vacation from, from New York to, to Europe, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me around. Man. Um, yeah. So first I, I really love aviation. Uh, actually, I think I feel like I know more than like the average person, but like sitting in the back of a plane, like it still terrifies me. Like, although I read all the stats and everything and it's supposed to be super safe. Like I'm still like, a freak of a passenger like where my like heart is pounding and like i'm like super sweaty and get really anxious so anyway yeah we got on a plane from la and then we are connecting through jfk in order to go to prague and then the first flight is fine we will get get into uh new york just fine we board the second flight and we take off uh with a delta flight um and then like an hour in kind of same situation you had yours was like four hours in an hour in the captain comes on and he's like one of our three hydraulic systems has failed um and I, I think he said something about like low pressure or low oil or something. And then anyway, we're going to, we're going to go back. We're going back to JFK. 
so then, you know, I, again, I'm like kind of anxious because I, you know, I'm, I'm already anxious on the plane as it is. Um, yeah. I start, I, I put on the little monitor to see like where we are and we're like, we've already turned around, right? Cause we're in the back. So we don't know what's going on up there. So we've like turned her back around. Everybody's pretty calm though. Like your plane that sounded like, well, your, yours was like more was going on. Like the pilots, like up and down the aisles and stuff. Like our pilot was like, cool. He was up there kind of explaining things. So we're okay. Nobody's yelling. Nobody's crying. I'm checking the screen. We're flying over Boston. Okay. We're doing okay. So I calm myself down. Everybody's pretty calm. And then he comes on and, you know, he's explained the situation again. He uh, explains, he's like, everything's normal up here. You don't have to panic. Everything's okay. So, like, lots of communication. And then, like, 10 minutes later, he comes on. And he's like, we're going to have a regular landing. But JFK has a policy where, like, we're going to have to roll the trucks because we're, like, we've got a ton of fuel on board. Obviously, we haven't burned it off. So, we're, you're going to see a bunch of lights and all that. So, we land. Everything was normal, right? So, we see the trucks. We park. Everything's good. Everybody's safe. Everybody's, like, cheering. Like, we made it. We we did it where everything was fine so everybody was like fine on that flight right so like so we exit the plane right so we're like back in the terminal and they're like oh just go to the next gate and then so for some reason like we land up we come back at like midnight or one in the morning and then so we move, move over to the next gate and there's another delta plane ready to go and then so they start boarding like it was like really fast like get off the one plane get on the next plane we're like all right everything's good so then we get on and uh well so like 50 people get on and then they stop and then they're like okay uh let's take these 50 people back off the plane so then unfortunately like i guess our pilots had timed out for the night because they i guess flew too long so at this point like everybody was pretty calm until they were kicked off that second plane and then people like were really pissed at this point and of course they like take it on the poor like agents who are like just trying to get people back on planes and they're doing OT. So like one eventually like packed up her stuff and was like, I'm leaving. I'm just trying to go help you guys out. But of course, everybody's like yelling at agents and so whatever. So in that, when they rebooked us for the next day at uh, 5 p.m., we took Ubers, we found hotels, we came back the next day. So the next day was pretty interesting. So we come back the next day and now these are the same people that were on the previous flight. Like everybody got rebooked for this plane. Of course, we get new pilots, we get a new plane. But everybody else is, we're all the same. We all recognize each other. We're all wearing the same thing from the day before, right? We don't have clothes. Um, so we got on the plane. And then you know how, like, maybe Kelsey, you can explain this as, like, uh, you know how, like, when you switch from ground power to, like, power of the plane, like, there's, like, a one second, like, flicker of lights and, like, everything transitions over? I mean, Kelsey, yep. you know, but, like, maybe you can explain that going over to, like, the APU, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, so the APU is called, I guess the pilot was telling us is auxiliary power unit and like it failed. So like it failed where like the plane completely shut down and all that was on is like the emergency lights. And then, so like, usually you don't notice it because it's like so fast of a switch, but like ours like completely shut down where it was like 20 seconds of darkness or a minute of darkness and except for the, except for the emergency lights. And like people at that point started to worry. They're like, they're, we have like no power on this plane, right? So the pilot like restarted the system of this APU. And then uh, then we started like rolling again and we're rolling, we're taxiing. And then the plane just Wait, hold shuts on. off. Hold, hold on. And again, the, yeah, yeah. You're, you're saying that you guys were parked at the gate and it went black or you were taxiing and it went black? Both, it went back several times. It went black like, three times at least, maybe three or four times. So the first time was when they were switching from ground to the plane power to the APU and it shut down. And then the pilot restarted it. Then we started, we pushed back and we started taxiing and then it like shut down again. While we were rolling, we were like moving and then the plane just went completely dark and then people like lost it. Like I lost it. Like, of course, my heart's like pounding. Everybody, everybody's yelling in different languages. They're like asking the flight attendants what's going on. Like, like we come to a stop with the plane like completely off, except for like all the exit emergency lights. Like all those are like full on lit. And again, it's, these are the same passengers from the night before we experienced our turnaround. So now they're like, this is the second plane where this is like a doomed flight. We're not going to Prague. Everybody's going to die. Everybody's losing their mind. And then... Uh, my my son who's eight he's like dad the plane just keeps turning off the plane keeps turning off and I'm like dude I'm already super anxious my heart's pounding and like he's like yelling this like to everybody around like the plane's turning off like we realize the plane's off uh, but again luckily the pilot comes on and the pilot was super professional guys that we think the APU is going bad on this plane um, we don't use it in flight we turn it off like it, all it does is like produce power I guess for the plane and then it turns on our engines I guess it made it sound like 
you know when you jump start a car and like after you jump start a car like the car's going just fine but like as long as you don't stop at like the grocery store and you like turn it off then it won't turn back on kind of thing so we couldn't get our engines to turn on because the APU didn't have enough power. Yeah, your a your APU is like that. It, your APU is used for power and air conditioning while you're on the ground, usually at the gate there. And then it is used as well to get the engines to move. Once you get the engines running, then you turn the APU off. So the APU is not needed in flight and you never use it in flight. It's just used on the ground. But it, yeah, it's like you said, it's, it's a jumpstart the engines, if you will. So the, yeah. the, it's, a little, it's a little jet engine that's sitting in the back there, and that jet engine turns the main, main motors that are, that are on, the, on the plane. So having the power go out while you're on the ground is pretty normal. Like, well, pretty normal. It can happen. Sometimes the, the cable that's plugged in, the, the outlet that's plugged into the plane falls out, uh, or sometimes they pull it out without telling everybody. And then the reason you see all the lights, the emergency lights on, is because those are run off of a battery pack. So they're going to run, you know, obviously in an emergency, you want to have those lights on there no matter what. So they're on a separate, totally different circuit than everything else. And they're run off of a battery pack. So everything, you know, all the electricity fails on the plane. People can still see where to go. Well, so that was what was going on in our plane. And we're like, we're freaking out and we're still just taxiing because <laughs> this APU keeps shutting down on us. And like, the, all we see are like emergency lights on and the completely plane, the plane is like completely dead, no air conditioning. And we're all freaking out in the back. So luckily, the, the again, the pilot's great communication was really helpful. He like gave us a step by step. He would come on like every like ten minutes. We're like, all right, we're gonna park at the mechanical area. And then like ten minutes later, like, okay, the pilot, the mechanics are looking at it. We could, we think it's this. They're working on it. We're gonna do paperwork. We've changed this. Uh, now we're gonna retest it. And like, and he even offered like, if anybody feels uncomfortable on this flight and would rather get off because we were like going nuts in the back. Uh, I'll, we'll drive, we'll go back to the gate and we'll take you off and we'll take your bags off and you can catch another flight. So, I mean, I'm like, okay, there's 200 people on here. I'm sure like a quarter are going to come off this plane and not a single one came off the plane. We didn't have to go back to the gate. They fixed the APU. They started the engines. Um, we trusted our pilot. He had great communication. He kept us in the loop, was totally transparent. And I think that's what like totally helped us out. But during that time, we were like really losing it took off like you know three hours later so but as far as losing power at the gate that's pretty normal while the plane is taxiing though that's strange that that would happen while the plane's actually moving forward on the regular engines but um you know they they got it fixed and the flight attendant came on and she goes uh we're having an electrical problem and then there was like a pause and uh so we're gonna restart your monitors and we're like dude and i'm like my heart is like just Although this already happened to me the first two flights, but like, don't come on and say like mid-flight we're having an electrical problem. <laughs> da, da, da. We're gonna restart your monitors. Like, who cares about the entertainment system? Like, nobody gives a crap about yeah. your. Just like, just rephrase that and be like, hey, we noticed. Like, just rephrase it. Like, anyway. we're having. And there's a problem with the electricity on our plane. We need yeah. To restart. yeah, yeah, we've got to restart. <laughs> and uh, after we've like already gone through two like eight planes with like issues, this was the last. This was the last flight. Can I can I ask like um, Kelsey? The the pilot says one of the three hydraulic systems is broken, and right. then the the flight then somehow takes off again with a, a similar, though maybe not identical issue, where there's... Are you saying it's the exact same plane? Because the fuel system and hydraulic systems are totally different things. Are you saying it was the exact <clears> same <throat> tail number that had the hydraulic issue and the exact same tail number that had a fuel issue? According to FlightAware, these, these were actually back-to-back. -back. Like, this was the flight from JFK to Prague on Sunday, July 24th, and then immediately that, that shows it was diverted, and it lands back at JFK. And then immediately after that, it takes off the next day to Accra. That was my flight. So Fred's flight that was the, has this hydraulic that same, issue. That was the, the same, same plane. plane. The same wow. plane. Yeah. Wow, oh, that's weird. <laughs> when I landed, I was like, you know, a couple of days later, I was looking into it and uh, I found my tail number of my plane. And, and then I was like, the second, the second time around, it also turned around. And and then of course, like, I'm like, I'm what, like seeing if, it, if I find it like on YouTube or anywhere. And then it happens yeah. to be so, on the so I, a hydraulic system and a fuel system are are totally two totally different things. They're not intertwined in in any way. So, uh, like the, the the redundancy on both systems is is the same. Usually, 
if you lose, let's say a hydraulic system, uh, you might have, and I'm just taking a guess here on the 767, you might have three hydraulic systems and you lose one, uh, then the other two usually will be able to control, you know, 90 or 95% of, of everything and, and be able to, the plane can continue flying, right? So the likelihood that you, you know, obviously if you lose all three, then that's a big problem, but it, that's obviously extremely rare. So to have one hydraulic system have a low pressure, that can happen because there's lines, there's hydraulic lines that just like anything, it's mechanical, it can end up failing. And that's why they have these redundant systems where it's all separated and independent. So most of the controls on the plane usually have two different hydraulic systems that are controlling it. So if one fails, the other can pick it up and continue. And and, and what, is, what is a hydraulic system? Um, you know, like it, it's, it's a pressurized line. So imagine like this, like the plane's heavy. It might be a few hundred thousand pounds. So if you were to just use your, the pressure, the leg pressure from your legs to push down on the brakes to stop something like that, it wouldn't be realistic. So if you have a, a pressurized line with fluid in it, then you can use just normal pressure and have the hydraulics squeeze it without you having to use your leg strength, right? Or to, to take the plane off the ground or to fly it, those are big control surfaces out there. So if you had to use your own personal physical strength to do it, it would be really hard, but because it's a hydraulic line, you do a little bit of strength and then the pressurized line helps control control it. So some planes that will just have, we call them gremlins, but like some planes just for whatever reason that wanna have different issues all the time, you know, they're just like problem children. Uh, but you know, the, the airlines, it costs them a lot of money to do these returns. Uh, for the fuel, refunds on tickets, all the headaches that are involved, the cost for that is very high for them. So they obviously don't want to have that. So maintenance, that's part of it, being uh, preemptive and doing all these checks and all this maintenance stuff so they don't have that issue because the amount of money that it costs them is obviously not, it couldn't keep doing that and stay in business. Right. Like, it's not like Delta's being like, hey, let's let's freak some people out by flying a broken plane. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, they, they're as interested, at, you know, as, as we are in, in having flights go through successfully. I'm like really curious now, because what I what I assumed the issue was, was, you know, there was some issue, um, some issue with the fuel system that, you know, the plane had to had to divert back to JFK. You know, Delta did some checking around. They're like, not a big issue. Reflew the plane had the same problem. They had to they had to come back. But now it seems like, according to to what you're saying, like it seems like a kind of a kind of a strange coincidence for that for these to be to totally different issues. To have to have the same plane do two returns for two totally separate issues within 48 hours, yeah, that's that's uh, that's definitely abnormal. Hydraulics and fuel, there's they really have nothing to do with each other. To have something that has a hydraulic issue one day and then a, a fuel issue the next day, that, that's weird but still even with those two failures even if you had both of them happen at the same time the plane would still be fine to fly back right and that's kind of the the engineers that designed these planes mm -hmm. it, it, it it's weird because they designed it in a way that's so simple when you look at it but to be the one to come up with the idea to make it that simple you have to be a genius if that makes sense right if you really study the, the systems and and how redundant they, they've looked at how to make everything it's pretty incredible when you get to a plane as a pilot they have this log book and in that log book it has all the maintenance things that have happened to that plane and you can see everything that's been done and everything is uh, shown to you so you can see everything mm -hmm. for the last couple of weeks that's going on with that plane so you'll know before you take off if it has any problems or there's anything that you should be concerned about and you can always as a pilot say like hey this this has this issue or this has issue happen like five times in a row like i don't want to take this plane like you can always reject the plane that's a thing so that's why i always say like realize your pilots are up there with you we're not going to fly a plane if we right. don't feel like if there's going to be safety is going to our, our lives we're not going to get them to jump in there and fly that plane that's just not how it's going to work for the cost of what happened all the extra fuel that we burned and blah 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 that's a lot of money but if they had mm -hmm. lost that plane in the ocean and all the cost of that is going to be a lot worse so that's that's yeah. the first side and the second side is, is that, you know, for, for us, let's say that we're tired or let's say that we say, Hey, I, I'm too tired to fly this flight, or I don't feel comfortable with this flight. And here's why, as long as it's a legitimate reason why you're not comfortable with it and you can defend that point, they're 
if the airline did come to you and say, hey, you, you said you were too tired to fly this flight, and so we're going to give you punishment for that, you could go to the, the governing body, the FAA, and say, like, hey, this is what they're trying to do, and I was too tired to fly, and this is why I was too tired, and I explained it to them, and now they're trying to penalize me, and the airline would be in a lot of trouble with, I guess, their boss, if you will, the FAA. So the, they put – so there's a lot of, like, checks and balances in aviation because we've, we've been through – you know, they, they say, you know uh, – you know, uh, lessons are learned in blood, you know, so all through the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, when aviation was more fresh and new and still trying to learn things, they had to learn some stuff the hard way. So now it's a lot different as far as for if there's a mechanical issue and you want to reject a plane or you're too tired to fly, you say, I'm too tired. There's no pushback. Could it have been like, like, I understand there are different systems, but wouldn't you possibly expect, like, let's say the plane was in poor condition somehow, would it be possible that having one issue might also correlate to having to having another like it'd be more likely to have a severe issue on a plane that already is poorly maintained the planes every so many days or hours there's all these different checks for different planes but they go through these different levels of checks right every every 30 days it might need this level of check and every 100 days or 180 days it might need this level of check so it it's you're not going to have and they do that so that way a plane doesn't get into disrepair right and they so after certain so many hours or so many whatever flight cycles it's different for every airline so i don't want to say specifically but um it's going to get these different levels of checks and obviously more infrequently are these like heavy checks where they just like rip the whole plane apart and put it back together again and check everything so there's these different levels and you you know that happens in the desert there's different places where they'll just that's all they do is tear the plane down and take all the paneling off and look at everything and inspect everything, check everything, and then put the plane, all the paneling back and whatever. So all that, all those checks happen. So a plane never gets into a disrepair state. Mm -hmm. Um, But no, if I showed up to a plane and they said, Hey, this thing just came back yesterday and it came back with a hydraulic issue. um, And this is what was fixed. And I looked at the last four or five days of the log book and said, okay, cool. That's the situation. I wouldn't then be thinking, oh, okay, maybe maybe there's something else. Maybe there's going to be a fuel issue. I wouldn't be thinking that. I would be thinking, okay, okay, cool, let's go fly. And then, you know, you go flying, and then all of a sudden, you, like in your case, you have this now. So if I'm the pilot on in your on your flight, I'm looking at it and going, okay, so now we have this fuel issue. So I'm gonna we're gonna call, we're gonna talk with maintenance on the phone and try to resolve this thing for that time when they're not talking to you, they're trying to resolve it to continue the flight and they're talking with maintenance and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. Can we fix it? Okay. No, we can't fix it. And that takes time for you to make a call to get maintenance on the phone. You guys to go over it and try to troubleshoot it three or four different ways. Okay. It's not working. Okay. Then we need to go back. Where are we going to go? Okay. Well, we got this much fuel. Okay. We're going to go to, we're going to go back to JFK because that's where our maintenance base is. And, and then the, the dispatchers who are also involved in it, I'll run the fuel, look at the winds, make sure that everything's, that's the best place to go to, the weather, they'll check all that. And then that decision gets made by everybody, Craig, that's what we're doing. And now, now we're going to go. And that's, it takes time. All that stuff takes time. And the pilots are focused on getting that done, not saying, hey, right now I'm talking to maintenance to try to resolve. I'll be back in five minutes. Like they're yeah. trying to figure out what's going on before and they make a definitive hey this is what we're doing we're going back to jfk so like with the fuel issue on on my flight from where it was flying the plane back to to jfk or wherever the closest airport was like at that point like as far as i understand from you it was perfectly safe is that is that right yeah because let's say let's say that i don't know obviously i wasn't there but let's just say your your one of your wing tanks had a massive leak where it just uh, whatever this massive hole opened up and it just drained out all the fuel well it, it could still fly on that other one tank to i mean now now it's definitely a, a different situation right like you've seen an engine flame out uh uh-oh like you're gonna feel a lot more you're gonna have a lot more anxiety now because now you have one engine instead of two so if that had happened then i would be more like oh crap this is this is now sucking but the planes are certified to be able to fly and it's different for every plane. I'm guessing on that plane, it's probably 180 minutes. So it's a, 
it's a twin engine operation. It's an extended range twin engine operation system, which is designed to allow you to fly whatever distance. So let's say three hours. And that means they're always within three hours of an airport on one engine. So the, when you, when your plane gets dispatched, it has these little circles on your route to say like, this is the closest airport to here. And that's your situation. So. Okay. So even, even if one of the engines, because when I was talking with the captain, he was suggesting that, you know, had we continued to a crowd, one of the engines could have flamed out. Now, had that happened, it sounds like there's still some room where the plane can fly even having had an engine flame out. Is that, is that correct? Right. But you're not going to be, so you were in the first two hours of your flight and that flight's right. what, like 11 hours, right? Or Yeah. It was like a 10 or 11 hour flight. Yeah. Okay. So, but you're not, you're not going to be two hours then and go, all right, we're two hours in. Let's just see. Like, let's just see how far we can get. <laughs> right. right. You're not going to, you're <laughs> right. going to go, okay, hey, this is an issue. It's come up. And then you're going to talk with maintenance. And then you guys are going to talk about it. Right now, you know, you got, you're two hours away from a maintenance place, a base, uh, wherever you're at. Now, if you go, if you go and now you're halfway in the middle, okay, crap. Now, now what's the best? You know, what's the direction of the wind and all that right. gets factored in. There's a, what's called a, like an equal time point. So they'll have a, a point like once you cross this point, you're better to continue on. And once you, before you're at that point, you need to yeah. turn back. So there's all that stuff gets factored in, but yeah, if, if you were in the middle of the ocean and all of a sudden, then that problem showed up, maybe they would divert to one of the other places, you know, the Azores or something else that's yeah. out that direction. So it's closer. And then the plane would land there and then you'd be stuck in, some other place like i said the pilots are up there they're with you there we don't have ejection seats so they're they're thinking about themselves as well so don't forget that right yeah no of course and i mean i have no doubt that that in in you know in any of these situations the pilots like <laughs> they're not being like hey let's let's fuck with these guys you know give them a little bit of turbulence like you know scare them around right they're um yeah they you know they they want to uh, <laughs> They want to land the plane successfully as much as, as much as any of us do. Before you even fly that plane for the very first time, that specific plane, the airlines spend, I don't know, 60, 70, $80,000 to train you on that one particular plane on how to fly it. Right. So, and then once that's done every several months, you're going back in for additional uh, training and they're training you for all different types of scenarios, right? There's so many stop gaps to prevent there from being like a real problem. We train for an engine failure every like next month I go for uh, training and it's going to be an engine failure. And then, and then you're going to come back around and then there's going to be a hydraulic failure and, and they'll fail. They'll fail all these different things on you in the simulator. And then there's a guy, you and the other pilot are there working out, trying to resolve the problem. And then behind you, there's a guy that's sitting there that has a screen that he's, He's saying like, okay, now we're going to fail this thing. Ha ha. And then they'll fail it. And then they'll watch you <laughs> and see how you handle the situation. And you don't know what's going to happen. So then you, you guys try to work it out and resolve the situation. Once it's resolved, you, you know, you come in and land. And then at the end of that, they do a debrief and they go over everything. Okay, look, you guys did this well. Uh, this is something I would work on or whatever the situation is. And they'll break all that stuff down for you. And that's happening every several months or every, let's say once or twice a year, you're going in and doing that. And if you've been doing that for, you know, 10 or 15 years, then when it happens, you're like, okay, this isn't that scary. I've done this before. And that's kind of why I referenced that Soli incident. What you don't train for is a, a dual engine failure in the first like 90 seconds. <laughs> like that's not something that they're going to give you in the simulator. So that's what made that, you know, one of the things that made that so incredible, but something like a fuel leak, or a hydraulic failure, or a fuel leak and a hydraulics failure, and an engine failure. If all those three things happened, it would suck, but it'd be like, okay, like we're still flying. We still got one engine. We can still get somewhere. And, you know, it's going to be stressful, but you're going to most likely get there. I mean, I, I know just recently there was a 767 that had an engine failure shortly after takeoff. And, uh, you know, people were taking all these photos of like flames shooting out of the engine. Like, this is so dramatic, but the guys came back around and landed it. It was, you know, just another, obviously uncomfortable, but yeah. Just another day at the office. The engine's just another day out. at the office for us. I mean, it sucks for you as a right. passenger because you guys have no control over it, right? You have no control over it. And at that time, the pilots are going to be busy handling the most important thing, which is fly the plane. Like yeah. you guys getting information is 
very low on the list of like things that we're really concerned about, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, first we got to fly the plane. We got to figure out the problem. Then we got to talk with air traffic control and start coordinating that stuff. And once all of the, all of those things are done and the plane is doing what it's supposed to be doing is like, okay, let's let the people know in the back. You know, if you're a nervous flyer, I would do what he does and just st- study, you know, learn about, learn about that thing that you're scared about. And like, I don't really like roller coasters, even though I know they're safe. I, I just, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> because there, there's nobody up there that's in it with me. The guy who's controlling it is sitting on the ground. So if it goes sideways, he's just like, oh, that sucks. You know, he's not up there with me. So. Maybe if there was somebody up there controlling the roller coaster with me, I'd feel better. But... Yeah, you should do a series. Pilot, 747 pilot rides like Easy. world's biggest roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Watch me crying and yeah, that would that would be fun. Okay. Everybody wants to see me jump out of a plane. I'm not really excited about that either, but I don't know. Maybe I'll do it. It's a good idea. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks, guys. Likewise.